She has published over 2,200 original articles <laughs> on diseases of the central and peripheral nervous system. Maybe she'll get to 2,000. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Giannini. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. I don't think I'll ever get to 2,000. <laughs> that would be, require me never to retire, so it's not going to happen. Um, so thank you for coming to this uh, session. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. You have seen the learning objectives uh, that we have listed. And uh, based on that, I want to say that this uh, discussion of the meningeal pathological processes will be uh, not in a comprehensive, a comprehensive one, but more of a discussion based on a surgical pathology point of view. And so what can come across your desk as a surgical pathology specimen, and essentially it responds to those biopsies which are done because of uh, most often of meningeal enhancement. Um, the inflammatory meningeal diseases include a lot of conditions. Uh, we'll focus in, on one, the IgG4 related disease, which is uh, um, has got a lot of attention lately, uh, but also on other inflammatory disorders, including sarcoid, granulomatosis with polyangitis and rheumatoid arthritis. And of course, we'll talk about infectious diseases of the meninges. Um, this is very basic, but I think it's important to remember what the meninges are. And uh, there are three parts to the meninges. The dura mater, which is thick and fibrous, and that's the pachymeninges, and the arachnoid and pia, which uh, correspond to the leptomeninges. And the, the significance of that is really that they are thin layers over the brain and spinal cord. And doesn't hurt to remember that uh, at the spinal cord level, the dura um, is separate from the periosteum. And there is a true real epidural space that contains fat where processes can happen, while intracranially, the dura and the periosteum are closely attached and often fused. When we look at these membranes, we need to remember how to look um, when they are normal. The dura is, the dura is pretty much almost an acellular fibrous membrane. You can recognize an inner layer of the dura, which is a little more dense, and then the dura itself and the vessels, which are generally uh, closer to the outer dura uh, than to the inner part. Then you have the arachnoid, and the arachnoid, of course, is this kind of uh, loose membranes with the uh, arachnoidal cap cells on top, which sometimes for little nest, and not always, but you can have even small calcifications, small samoma bodies at the level of the cap cells. And then you have the pia, which is this very thin layer right in contact with the brain. And of course, throughout this membrane, there are vessels. When we think of meningeal inflammatory infectious diseases, we have to remember different things to understand the different processes. One, if the process is infectious, is what is the agent of the infection? It can be viral, can be bacterial, can be a fungus or a parasite. Then the site, of course, if it's a, of course, in the epidural space, if it occurs in the subdural space, if it occurs directly in the meninges, both the lactomeninges and the pia. The type of process is also very important. If it is an acute inflammatory process, a subacute or a chronic process. And of course, when you put all these three things together, you come up with what is the, your diagnosis. So for instance, you can have an acute bacterial process that involves the epidural space at the spinal cord level, and then you have an epidural abscess. You can also have a subdural empyema when you have an acute uh, uh, bacterial inflammation, which involves, which forms kind of a similar to an abscess, but in the subdural space and is circumscribed. And then you have the large group of the meningitis, 
uh, both the leptomeningitis and the pachymeningitis. And the, that's pretty much the field of surgical pathology mostly. Uh, and mostly are actually the pachymeningitis and the leptomeningitis with uh, present outside the acute forms um, with enhancement of the meninges. Now, the reason important thing to remember and is how they present a, a process that involves the dura. So the enhancement, it's really peripheral to the brain and does not involve the sulci. Of course, the dura is not in the sulci, which is different from what occurs in leptomeningitis. In leptomeningitis, yes, you can have enhancement at the periphery of the brain, but what distinguishes really the leptomeningitis is the fact that the process involves the leptomeninges, so the arachnoid, the pia, and so it extends down in the uh, sulci of the brain. So when you evaluate a biopsy and you know the imaging, if the process is a leptomeningitis, you should have a biopsy that reflects that location, not simply the dura, because the dura is not going to give you the answer to the process. And, and it's important to know. When we hear the term hypertrophic meningitis is a little less specific. It refers to re robust thickening of the meninges, which can be diffuse or nodular, but doesn't tell you exactly which one of the membranes it's involved. I gave you a case to start with, and it's a case of a 52-year-old man with a 24-month history. Uh, it started apparently with a fracture at the cervical core, at the cervical spinal level after a fall, but he didn't recover. He continued to develop neck pain, which became severe and persistent. He developed tingling involving the right and the left hand, primarily the fourth and fifth. Uh, finger first, and then he started having a difficulty with motion, and he, he wasn't able to open bottles anymore with his hands. And then from the arms, it started going to the legs, and he has started having gait deterioration. And what, what particular of these patients is that he shows peripheral enhancement, as you can see here, of the meninges, and in particular the dura, along the spinal cord. So at this point, even if you have not seen uh, a biopsy from this patient, there, are, there is already a long list of things that you can think about. And really what can present with enhancement, it's a long list of, uh, of things. It could be an infectious process. It could be sarcoid. It could be IgG4 related disease, rheumatoid arthritis. It could be a variety also of neoplastic processes, including lymphoma or leukemia. It could be metastatic uh, process like a carcinomatosis. Rarely you can have a primary diffuse meningeal gliomatosis or a primary diffuse meningeal melanocytic tumor, and so others. One thing not to forget is also the occurrence of meningeal enhancement, which can be related to CSF hypotension. And if you have an inflammatory process and you cannot find any cause, of course, you have a case of idiopathic pachymeningitis. So at this point, I think I will stop for one second and I'll try to show you the slide that you had. It came like small fragments here. Uh, and even in, at this power, which is very low power, you can recognize that this was a dural biopsy and it's definitely abnormal. It's too cellular. Um, normal dura should look kind of pink. And this has a lot of blue. Now you can look at several of the fragments. This is probably this largest one. One is one of the one that's uh, most representative of this process, um, you see that there is a dense inflammatory infiltrate here. And as you go close, you can see that in this infiltrate, there is a number of 
lymphocytes, but also there is a number of plasma cells. And even at this power, you can see there are also eosinophils. If you go back a little more toward the lower power, you see that there is a lot of kind of fibrosis, but you also see that there is a very vague whirling of this fibrosis. So that is what it's called a storyform pattern. Uh, here you can actually see that some of these, uh, at the center of some of these uh, storyform fibrosis, you can recognize, if I can find it, uh, there are some vessels. And in particular, there was one, which I'll show you in picture, because I don't seem to be able to find it now, that had a small venule. I think this is also one up here, which is almost occluded. So this is what the uh, biopsy showed. And let's go back to our pictures. Again, you can see there is this kind of story form pattern of fibrosis. Here was a better one that I had been able to photograph. You see that at the center of this, there is a small venule which is involved by the process. So it's, there is a venulitis and it's occluded. And when you look at the inflammatory infiltrate, there is a lot of plasma cells. And of course, lymphocytes. And as I showed you, there are also some eosinophils. Now, in this case, uh, we obtain both IgG4 and IgG stains. And as you can see, there is a large number of IgG4 positive plasma cells and also a high number, of course, of IgG uh, plasma cells. But the ratio is at least 50%. So it's a very high ratio. So in this case, the diagnosis is of a chronic lymphoplasmocytic inflammatory process with storiform fibrosis and increased IgG4. And it's consistent with IgG4-related disease. This is one, essentially, the most classic case that I've ever seen of uh, um, IgG4-related disease. And of course, it's a diagnosis that then it's a clinical diagnosis. For us, pathologically, it's consistent with it, but this is what it turned out to be. Now, meningeal IgG4-related disease has received a lot of attention in the last few years to the point that many of the clinicians come to you and the first question that they ask you is not even what you saw in the meningeal biopsy, but did you do IgG4? It's most commonly a process that involves the packing meninges, both intracranially and spinally, but definitely the case I've shown you is unusual because the intracranial location is much more common. It may involve only the meninges, but often involves also other sites. So it involves the adjacent orbit, the sinuses, uh, the pituitary stalk and the gland, and also other organs throughout the body. Generally, there is elevated serum IgG4 that is a sensitive marker, although not completely specific. It can be absent, however, the elevation of IgG4, especially in the cases that are restricted to the brain and don't have a systemic involvement. On this graphic, you can see the uh, age distribution is typically a disease of adults with a maximum frequency between the fifth and the seventh decade. Now, we know that the fibrosis is a nonspecific fibroblastic activation that's caused by aberrant, an aberrant immune response to an um, antigen that, however, is still unknown. Most likely, this is a complex immune response behind the IgG4 production and it's IL-10 mediated, and probably is diverting a classic TLPR T2 response in favor of IgG4. The IgG4 excess, it's actually probably a counter-regulatory mechanism 
to try to decrease the inflammation rather than being a primary driver of the disease. So IgG4 in this case is a good marker, but it's not part of probably of the pathogenesis of the disease. Now, the article in Modern Pathology in 2012 is still the best reference regarding what are the diagnostic histologic criteria for IgG4. And there are major histological features associated with IgG4-related disease, and they include the findings that I've shown you in the, just in the case you have seen, dense lymphoplasmocytic inflammation, fibrosis, which is arranged at least focally in a storyform pattern, and the presence of obliterative previtis. The number of IgG4 cells is increased. Um, generally, the threshold that's given is 10 per high power field, which is probably a little low in the CNS. The ratio of IgG4 to IgG is greater than 40%. And when you have the combination of at least two of the major histological features with the uh, cutoff for the plasma cells, that's kind of diagnostic for IgG4-related disease. Now, IgG4-related disease were first described uh, in the field of autoimmune pancreatitis. And that's where the fibrosis arranged at least Focally in a story form pattern, as you can see on this side of the picture, is very common. The dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. And the concept of literary plebitis is quite characteristic and much more easily recognizable in the pancreas compared to other sites, because in the pancreas, the arteries and veins go together. So once you find the artery, you can find, you know that there should have been a small vein there, and therefore you can see that there is obliterative uh, phlebitis. But it's much harder to see at other sites. And this is from the same paper. You can see how in different organs, like the lacrimal glands, salivary glands, lung, kidney, and lymph node, the different uh, characteristic findings are present in different proportion. And in most, time, most times, they're not present together. And same is true in the meninges. As I said before, this is practically the only case that I've seen with a classic, definite, all three the classic and definite the, uh, major histologic criteria, including the dense lymphoplasmocytic inflammation, the storiform fibrosis, and the obliterative phlebitis. This is another case. This is a 65-year-old woman um, with left ear and, pain, and face pain. And as you can see here, she has a marked thickening of the tentorium. There is thickening also and enhancement of the uh, pachymeninges of the dura in the posterior fossa. And here, actually, there is a thickening that almost mimics a mass, a small mass, which could also you know, raise the possibility, for instance, of a meningioma with extension uh, to the rest of the meninges. And here, you actually see this enhancement, which is extending into the internal auditory canal following the seventh and eighth nerve. Again, the differential diagnosis of a case like this, even before you ever get the biopsy, is quite wide and includes all the conditions that I mentioned at the beginning. But then when you see the biopsy, and in this case, there was primarily storiform fibrosis, at least focally, and the dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, the first differential that comes to mind is IgG4-related disease. And here you can see it's less evident, less marked than in the case you have seen before, but there is an increase of plasma cells and an increase of the ratio between IgG4 and IgG above 40%. Well, the normal ratio is above 4 to 5%. So this is also another case that's consistent 
with IgG4 related disease. One of the best papers in the uh, meninges of IgG4 related disease is still the paper by Beatrice Lopez uh, uh, from a few years ago, where they, she compared actually some cases of uh, biopsies with a, a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltration, which actually turned out to be clinically IgG4 related disease with another number of inflammatory biopsies, which did not turn out to be um, IgG4 related disease. And as you can see, she found to a different extent, severe lymphoplasmocytic inflammation. Actually in two cases, she had some giant cell present, which is a little unusual. There was variable, but mostly uh, severe, moderate to severe fibrosis. And the phlebitis was kind of severe in one case, but minimal to moderate in others. In all cases, there was an increase of IgG4, especially compared to the one that did not turn out to be IgG4-related disease. But you can see that the range is quite wide from 11 to 54. And again, where the ratio could be uh, calculated, um, there was an increase of the ratio, although, although not in all cases, that ratio was above 40%. And comparing uh, the cases that turn out to be to have IgG4 related disease to the others, you can see that both the number of IgG and IgG4 uh, positive plasma cells is markedly and significantly increased, as is the ratio. So, with some caveat and uh, considering all the findings together. The criteria that have been uh, proposed at the systemic level and for other organs seems to work very well also in the CNS. Now, in addition to the major histological criteria, there are some additional criteria that have been proposed. One is the presence of plebitis without, however, the obliteration of the lumen and the increased number of xenophils, which I actually showed you in the first case. But I find as interesting and important to recognize that there are also some findings which are not consistent with IgG4-related disease. And if you have well-formed epithelioid granulomas and prominent neutrophilic infiltrates, that should really take you away from the diagnosis of IgG4-related disease. Here you have a case with well-formed epithelioid granulomas. And here you have at the center actually acute neutrophilic infiltrate. These findings are really not consistent with the diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. And if you do the IgG4 and the IgG, however, you still can find increased number of IgG4 and an increased IgG4, IgG to IgG4 ratio, although maybe not above 40%. So the message here is that you have to really consider all the findings together and cannot use the IgG4 and IgG by themselves as a diagnostic uh, um, criteria. Now, the disease that, that it's important for neuropathologists to know, of course, is sarcoidosis. It's a worldwide disease. We don't know uh, the causes of it. Uh, it's characterized by non-necrotizing granulomatous inflammation with very well-formed granulomas generally and presence of giant cells. And sarcoidosis is truly, uh, can be a big mimicker uh, for anything in the CNS. It can involve the CNS with intraparenchymal lesion with leptomeningeal lesions or with dura-based lesions. And it can also involve the peripheral nervous system. Here you have an example of sarcoid involving the cerebellum. And you can see that the uh, most severe uh, infiltrate is in the leptomeninges. But you can also see that this granulomatous inflammation is extending deeply in the cerebellar cortex. And here you have well-formed granulomas with giant cells and no necrosis. 
This is the case of sarcoid involving the uh, didura and forming a mass, which actually was thought to represent a meningioma. Uh, during surgery, we received an intraoperative consultation and we told them that was not a meningioma, that most likely this was sarcoid and this was what this uh, mass showed, this well-formed granuloma with these uh, giant cells. And actually, this was a surgery that was aborted by the surgeon once we told them that it was probably sarcoid. And here you can see the imaging uh, just postoperatively, and you can see the imaging after about a year of steroids. So most of the mass truly um, resolved with uh, a steroid treatment uh, and so it was a truly good choice for the surgeon to stop on a surgery that was quite dangerous given the size and the site of the mass. Granulomatosis with polyangitis is uh, the old Wegener granulomatosis is a form of systemic vasculitis that can involve the CNS. Typically involves uh, the respiratory tract, the lung or the kidney. Um, not always with all three sites at the same time. The CNS can be involved uh, uh, with other sites and rarely in isolation. Of course, if the disease is known, if uh, the disease presents at the CNS level, it will not be biopsied because the diagnosis is kind of derived from the systemic involvement. So actually the cases that I've seen in my career of granulomatosis with polyangitis have been cases in which there was not a history before. So it simply came because of the uh, meningeal involvement. Microscopically, it's associated with quote unquote necrotizing granulomatous lesion. The granulomatous component is much less evident than in, in the other conditions. Uh, it's usually ANCA positive and particularly C ANCA. And the stimulus that initiates the autoantibody formation is not known. However, once that um, ANCA is uh, formed, it activates the neutrophils. And it is the neutrophils that release cytokines, which damage to the endothelial cells. And then it starts the inflammatory process we see. In classic full-blown examples of granulomatosis with polyangitis, you have areas of geographic necrosis. You have granulomatous inflammation. Generally, the giant cells are scanned and surround the areas of necrosis. There is a small vessel vasculitis, as you can see here. And typically, there is in these lesions presence of neutrophils. In the early lesions, you may have predominantly a small accumulation of uh, neutrophils, sometimes to the formation of microabscesses, or you can have this kind of neutrophilic necrosis and collagen necrosis. It's kind of a dirty necrotic appearance of the meninges. This is a case of a 66-year-old man. If you look up here, you can see uh, there is uh, enhancement of the pachymeninges of the dura, quite diffuse uh, on both hemispheres. And here was the appearance of the biopsy, this kind of necrobiotic appearance of the dura, and a lot of uh, uh, neutrophils, and here in higher power. Rheumatoid arthritis can also involve the meninges. Um, as you know, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder with symmetric peripheral erosive polyarthritis, also of unknown etiology. There can be extraarticular manifestation that involve a lot of organs, lung, kidney, heart, and skin, and others, and also the peripheral and the central nervous system. The central and the peripheral nervous system uh, can uh, be involved, and there are different manifestations. One which is very important to remember is the formation of what uh, extradural panels 
or vertebral body collapse with spinal cord compression. And uh, one of the typical uh, dangerous things that can happen is the atlantoaxial subluxation. But you can have also peripheral neuropathy or meningitis. Now, rheumatoid meningitis is rare. And typically, when it occurs, it occurs in the setting of a long-standing severe rheumatoid arthritis. In a review of 48 cases, uh, about 50% of the patients had a history of rheumatoid arthritis for 10 or more years. And there were only five patients in whom there was no prior clinical history. But these patients also developed joint symptoms um, at, either at the time of the meningeal involvement or shortly after. And I've seen a case like this that actually was very difficult to diagnose as it had also involvement of the cortex. There was also a, a kind of a superficial cerebritis. Um, it can involve both the pachy and or the leptomeninges. There is a typically um, extensive inflammation, formation of rheumatoid nodules and or vasculitis. And of course, this Patients can have focal neurological symptoms or cranial neuropathy, which are the most frequent, uh, depending on the size. In the past, this was a disease of high mortality, often diagnosed at autopsy, but that's not the case anymore, fortunately. This is a case that one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Vobel, had a few months ago. This was a 69-year-old woman with a known history of rheumatoid arthritis, and I think you can easily recognize the presence of a true rheumatoid nodules with the central necrosis, the peripheral palisading of the istiocyte, the giant cells, and the dense plasma cell infiltrate. And this patient also presented with confluent leptomeningeal enhancement. I don't remember exactly why they biopsied, but probably because the patient did not respond to therapy and they were concerned about other possibilities. This was also a case that we saw a few years ago, a 78-year-old woman with a history of 10 years of rheumatoid arthritis, a very diffuse leptomeningeal process, as you can see here, but also with nodules. These patients also did not respond to treatment. And at one point when they don't respond to treatment, then the neurologist start wondering, you know, is it truly that or am I missing something that should be treated differently? And we received this uh, brain biopsy. I think you can recognize the brain below. And you can see here the leptomeninges. The leptomeninges are market, markedly thickened. We are up three millimeters. There is chronic inflammation and there was extensive necrosis. And this is something that I've seen more than one time. There's very extensive necrosis in the meninges and going closer, there is a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate. You can see here the necrosis. There is even some rare giant cells and mostly plasma cells. So, of course, this is a diagnosis that uh, it needs to exclude uh, infection. And it becomes a confirmed diagnosis of rheumatoid meningitis only after all the other causes are excluded. Every time you see a lot of necrosis, um, you should consider infection. And if you see it at the time of intraoperative consultation, the most important thing is to recommend and make sure that the surgeon obtains cultures because cultures are undoubtedly much more sensitive than anything we can do once the tissue has been processed and is now in paraffin. This is a case of my mycobacterial meningitis. You can see here these uh, um, relative well-formed uh, epithelioid granulomas and the courts large areas of necrosis, which is one of the typical appearances of a mycobacterial infection. Uh, see if I can go ahead. And 
here is a fight stain uh, in a different case, again, with this necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. And don't think that you're going to see mycobacteria to this extent in many cases. I usually use this picture because they're easy to see, but it can be very difficult and time consuming just to find a few mycobacteria. Uh, so you do need a lot of patience. You need the stains and you need a lot of patience. This is a case of blastomycosis, and you can see in this case, you can recognize there is peripheral enhancement uh, surrounding the brainstem, but there is also presence of enhancement in the leptomeninges. Here you can recognize, you can see the necrosis, you can see the giant cell, and you can actually see the uh, fungus here inside this giant cell. And here on a PAS, and on a GMS, you can recognize blastomyces from the broad-based budding that's typical of this fungus. Here is a case that another one of my colleagues had, uh, Dr. Ragunathan, 56-year-old with a progressive decline and pachymeningitis. And the meninges at first didn't look that bad, while, although uh, a KP1 was obtained, and you can see there are a lot of macrophages here, and that's not how the meninges should look. As I've shown you at the beginning, they should be almost a cellular. So deeper levels were obtained, and on deeper levels, there was this granuloma that came out, which at first uh, appeared to be highly nice. But if you really go in high power, there is central necrosis here, as you can see. And in the central necrosis, there were actually septated fungal ivy consistent with aspergillus. Uh, I've never regretted doing a levels on a biopsy, which at first doesn't show much and doesn't explain what you see on the imaging. And uh, I think it's better to do deeper level than to leave the diagnosis inside the block. Of course, if you have a process uh, which is inflammatory in the meninges and no a specific pathological finding is present, then you have to go with the term of idiopathic, uh, of the idiopathic process. This is a case of idiopathic uh, hypertrophic uh, pachymeningitis. Here you can see the dura is about two millimeter thick. There is a very dense uh, lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with fibrosis. And you say, why? Why is this not IgG4 related disease? Well, this is the infiltrate. It's predominantly a T cell infiltrate with few CD20 positive uh, B cells with some IgG positive cells. And this, I can guarantee you, was the single and only IgG4 positive plasma cell in there. So this is not a idiopathic. Uh, this is an idiopathic uh, hypertrophic pachymeningitis and not a case of IgG4 related disease. And uh, some cases remain idiopathic even when they form a mass. Not everything that forms a mass um, will a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate um, is a case of IgG4 related disease or find a specific cause. There are some of these cases which still remain idiopathic and for which we still could use, although it's a little bit out of fashion, the old term of inflammatory pseudotumor. In this case, as you can see, there was a lot of uh, lymphoplasmocytic inflammation forming a mass. And you can see that this actually extended into the underlying parenchyma. And this patient had a steroid dependent uh, disease. When they decreased the steroids, it would flare up and grow or would start going down as soon as the steroids were given but was not IgG4-related disease. And last, I just want to remind you of uh, this condition um, 
of uh, um, enhancement of the meninges in conditions uh, of intracranial hypotension. Uh, this is this condition, the, which was described originally in 1995, is now much more known, and many neurologists would not miss it. But it can still happen that uh, you have a patient uh, presenting with this uh, diffuse enhancement of the meninges. Uh, and it's thought to be a case of pachymeningitis, is biopsied, and you find that bio, you find the dura, which is practically normal, except that if you look at the very deep um, contour of the dura, you may find a very delicate, wispy subdural membrane. Now, this is a very important condition to recognize because this is not a normal dura. And if they have not thought about it before, you can prompt them to actually look for the cause of this meningeal enhancement, which is not inflammatory. Instead, if you call it a non-diagnostic biopsy, uh, they won't think about it. They didn't think it the first time, they won't think it after. And the patient may continue to receive a very a kind of a aggressive um, anti-inflammatory treatment with steroids, which can have a lot of side effects. So it's an important thing to recognize. Don't ever say, well, this is just normal dura, but try to look uh, more carefully and see if this could be actually the condition that's underlying um, the pachymeningeal enhancement. So, I think we have, uh, I hope at least, that, that I was able to give you an idea of the meningeal pathological processes that can come as a surgical pathology specimen uh, following uh, the presence of meningeal enhancement, and um, that I gave you some good criteria to diagnose and reject the diagnosis of IgG4 related disease as well of other inflammatory condition. And um, this is it. Any question? Thank you, Dr. Giannini. Um, now we're moving to the Q&A um, aspect of the talk. Uh, you can submit your questions via the chat box or also potentially on mute to ask a question. Um, Please make sure that the message goes to everyone when you're doing when you're using the chat, so I can read them um, and ask Dr. Giannini about them. So the first question I am actually seeing is not visible to everybody. Um, how specific is IgG4 to IgG ratio for excluding Erdhan-Chester or Rosai Dorfman disease? Um, I have to say that I've. I haven't done IgG and IgG4 in cases that I've, I have diagnosed as is a Rosai Dorfman or Ardine Chester disease. What I can tell you is that uh, uh, both conditions present, uh, well, they present differently. Rosai Dorfman often presents as a mass. The other is more complicated, the clinical presentation. Histologically, however, they are different. Uh, you know, the... Uh, Rosai Dorfman has a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, but you also recognize the uh, typical cells, which are S100 positive in the background, which are these large pale cells with empiripolysis very often. So uh, the lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate may make you think of IgG4. Um, but I think the, the picture is different. The presence of these pale, foamy cells in the background is quite different. And so it should prompt you at least to do an S100. Now, I have, I have to say I haven't done IgG and IgG4 on, on those cases. <laughs> so I don't know. I tend not to do things that I may regret doing uh, because then uh, I don't know what to do with the, with the finding. Regarding Ardine Chester, um, Ardine Chester in the brain most frequently gives you um, a very 
uh, istiocytic uh, foamy infiltrate. It can be quite variable. I don't remember ever seeing a dense lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate with it. I have seen cases, uh, um, I've seen two-tone giant cells in Ardyme Chester, although they are not as frequent as they are in the retroperitoneum in my experience. Um, and I have seen some cases of advanced Ardyme Chester where, which was involved in the parenchyma, in, in particular in the brainstem, but that was an autopsy case because generally you don't get brainstem biopsies. And in that case, it was quite advanced. Uh, there was more actually. All right, um, next question is about your sarcoid mass that was mimicking a, mimicking a meningioma. Um, yeah. Why would tuberculoma not be included in the interoperative differential? It looked uh, uh, very um, non-necrotizing and very well formed. Now you only have one picture there. One thing that sometimes that helps and maybe you have seen it more frequently in the lung than in the brain. Uh, you can have actually a mixture of well-formed and uh, I would say florid giant cell granulomas with some that are more sclerotic and fibrotic. So we really favored sarcoid. And of course, the consequence if, uh, if we had favored an infection would have probably been the same because there was the decision if you would go after a formidable uh, meningioma or let it be and treat it either with steroids or antibiotics. But in that case, we truly favor sarcoid intraoperatively. Next question is, how do you quantify the IgG4 to IgG ratio? Well, <laughs> I count them. Um, I always hope to also have a fellow on service so this fellow can do the counting too. But I typically choose the areas where I see, actually I go to the areas where there are most IgG4 positive plasma cells, well recognizable, and I go and count them. And then I choose exactly the same area on the IgG and I count them and I do the ratio. And I often do it at least in two or three sites. But when it's that apparent, it's generally not a problem. You know, it, generally, it's not a difficult count, I have to say. But it, you need to just count them. That makes sense. I don't have another rule. <laughs> Um, for the diagnosis of IgG4-related disease, does the 40% ratio cutoff not apply if there are granulomas present? IgG4-related disease should not have granulomas, and especially should not have well-formed granulomas. If you find a lot of granulomas, if you find granulomas, that should take you away. And... Uh, you have to be careful. As I say, sometimes, you know, you don't want to do stains when you don't need it. Um, because if you have a granuloma, for instance, in the lung, one of the uh, granulomatosis with polyangiitis, it's very well known to have increased the IgG4 and IgG. And if you only went with that, you could say, well, could this be IgG4 related disease? No, that's granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So if you have a clearly granulomatous uh, process that involves the dura, I would try to not to do IgG and IgG4, because even if the ratio is increased, it doesn't tell you that that's the disease. It probably is not, because those are uh, among the criteria that tend to exclude the diagnosis. Um, next is Dr. Perry, who says, wonderful lecture, Katarina. Can you mention a bit about the importance of other clinical findings, serum levels of IgG4, other sites of inflammatory disease, et cetera, in IgG4-related disease? Mm -hmm. Can you still make the disease 
I guess, the diagnosis of the disease if it's only in the CNS? Well, um, we have had some cases where, um, I, I remember a, a distinct case where um, the disease involved only the orbit and the meninges. And uh, there was no systemic signs, but ultimately over time, that's what turned out to be. So I think if everything fits histologically uh, and you follow the criteria and you have excluded the other things, uh, um, you can say that that's consistent. Uh, I personally have never made the trait diagnosis of either IgG4 related disease, like I have not made a diagnosis of sarcoid on a brain biopsy, but I've certainly said that things would be consistent with it. Makes sense. Dr. Gogden also says, thank you, Dr. Giannini. Have you had a lymphoplasmocyte rich meningioma causing differential diagnostic problems? In 20 and some years, I have seen two cases of lymphoplasmocytic meningioma. I don't know other people what how many they have seen. I don't know how many Dr. Terry may have seen. But in my opinion, the lymphoplasmocytic meningioma is one of the rarest form <laughs> of uh, meningiomas. And one thing that needs to be said, um, so I, I haven't had that problem. But there is another thing to consider. Uh, these are biopsies which are done for pachymeningitis. So you generally don't have a mass. With the lymphoplasmocytic meningiomas I have seen, which is true, you know, the lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate may almost obscure the meningioma, but they were clear cut masses. So I think you always have to keep in mind your clinical and, and what you have. Um, next, Dr. Camelo Piragro, and I have to say that this is my experience too, unfortunately, saying that IgG antibody is often very dirty for them on FFPE with a high background, which makes it hard to interpret and requires a lot of back and forth to properly quantify positive plasma cells. Do you have any suggestions? Patience. <laughs> Patience, because it's true. But again, you know, you try to go on the area that's the cleanest. Um, that, that's what you do. And, and it's time consuming because uh, it's definitely time consuming, and it's definitely true that the IgG stain often has background, more than the IgG4. The IgG4 is much cleaner. The others have as background. But then you really go in high power and you count them and try to do the best and make sure that you're counting the plasma cells that, you know, where you see the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and, and you do your best. I, I don't have a, um, a solution for that. All right, there's about four more questions. Um, beautiful presentation, Katarina. What is your experience with 16S rDNA sequencing for infectious organisms when no cultures are performed in inflammatory disease, otherwise NOS? Um, I don't have a lot of experience. I have to say that um, before doing that, um, I typically go to one of my colleagues in microbiology, Dr. Preet, and I say, is it worth doing it? And I let her decide. And she has specific criteria where she would do it or, or won't do it. Um, that's what I, I really do. Okay, so can we borrow her everywhere? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she has a big blog, so I think I can I ask her and... <laughs> I can ask her what are her most, uh, you know, how did she suggest, but typically, you know, I don't know if it happened to other people, but I have had people who ask me to do the study 
when I only see a lymphocyte walking by itself on the dura. And, and that's inappropriate. Yeah. I mean, if, you sus if the pathology makes you suspect that I think it's fort. Uh, but not when the, the biopsy is really, is really sometimes kind of non-diagnostic. Right, doctor. And that's, uh, I think, is what she follows the four criteria. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Dr. Martinez Saez um, says, thanks for the wonderful talk. We found a high IgG4 to IgG ratio surrounding a Rathke's cleft cyst in a 14-year-old boy. We mentioned it on the histological findings, but not in the diagnosis. However, the clinicians wondered about it. We thought it was a reactive phenomenon. What do you think? I would have thought what you thought. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, the, the Ratke's class cyst, I mean, one thing is you, if it's intact, but I've seen a lot of reaction around Ratke's class cyst and, and they are often, you know, kind of broken. And I wouldn't, I've seen a lot of lymphocyte, uh, lymphoplasma cells also recently in a ruptured colloid cyst. I don't know if anyone has had the same thing. And that's why I would say, would I have ever done IgG and IgG4 in a ruptured colloid cyst because I had a lot of lymphoplasma cells? I would say, no, I don't wanna get myself in trouble if it's not needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one last question from Dr. Jang. Uh, great talk, thank you. Is it possible that an idiopathic hypertrophic pachymeningitis is a burnt out or inactive IgG4 related disease? I don't know. I doubt, however, because uh, uh, as you saw, for instance, uh, that case that I shown, it doesn't look like anything burnt out. Uh, it looks a very florid process. So I think we, we know more about these uh, pachymeningeal processes, but there is a lot that we don't know. I don't think we probably know the full spectrum. All right, well, that takes care of, us, of all the questions. Thank you so much, Katarina. Um, I